thank everyone for coming. I'm going to be blazing through this so that nobody's late for closing ceremonies. So, you oh, you love you. Thing is the thing. Please close the door on your way out. Love Thank you. you. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, obviously, this is going to be about Scott. How do you get production and performance? So, if you're in the wrong panel, now is your time to just slide out all casual life. Or a bucket, like you're bad out of hell. Okay. So. I'm Anya, mm -hmm. and I have performed in the cosplay contest since the first year of Sikido Con. The first year, two years, I did walk-ons, I decided to go into skits. So I've done three skits for each of the last three years. Yesterday I was BMO, uh, just a bit of background. And I also have um, theater background, so I'm going to be talking about how to put together skits using some of the experience that I have, cosplay skits in general, and just theater stuff. So here's just our quickly prepared little panel I have. I'm going to start with your skit writing and planning, going to audio, casting, basic theater technique practice, and I'll have a Q&A at the end. So if there's anything that you're wondering more about, just keep it in the back of your head, and I'll be happy to address that at the end. All right. So when it comes to skit writing, that's the first thing you're going to do. I like to talk about the cake analogy, which is essentially when you're baking a cake, uh, you have two components. You have the actual pastry part, and then you have the icing. Now, a cake can still be a cake without the icing. You can just have the pastry part in this little cake, but the icing definitely adds a nice little flair and more fun to it. The same ha uh, happens with your skit. So you're going to have the substance, which is like the cake, so you basically that's the necessary part for it to be a skit, and then you have the icing, which are the extra little touches that kind of bring it up a level but aren't necessary for the skit. So here's uh, what we're going to use to identify them. The biggest uh, thing that I see when I, when I watch skits is these things being reversed. So people using things that should be icing as the cake, and so the whole skit kind of just falls apart, unfortunately. Um, so the cake is going to be your storyline, obviously, a very important part of it, and your hook. So if it's going to be a jazz number, if you're going to sing a song, if you're going to parody something, uh, that's going to be your hook. It's going to be the thing that people are going to remember your skit by. And then you have the icing, which are things like references. That's the biggest thing. Uh, whenever you're doing a skit, like say, for example, you want to do a skit about Bioshock Infinite, um, not everybody in, this, in the auditorium has watched, or sorry, played Bioshock Infinite, so if you make all of these references and being able to comprehend your skit uh, depends on knowing these references, unfortunately half your audience is going to be completely lost and won't be able to appreciate your skit. So it's important to make references kind of the extra little icing on the cake and not making uh, your storyline have to be you know, comprehensible with the references. And of course the quality of cosplay. If you decide I'm going to you know, spend $500 on a cosplay uh, and then just have like a not really skit, Unfortunately, it's not really skit, it's more of a walk-on, so that's why we do walk-ons. But anyway, the quality of your cosplay is, is the icing on cake, it's not the cake itself. So when it comes to skit writing, uh, the biggest thing that I have to stress is to keep it simple. Because simple done well is better than complicated done poorly. And the example that I to, like to use is Super Mario Brothers, because I'm sure we're all, we all know the Super Mario Brothers games. Um, every single game has the exact same storyline, and that is... Peach gets kidnapped by Bowser, Mario saves her, the end. It's a very simple storyline, but would we say that Super Mario games suck because the storyline is so simple? I don't think so, uh, because they, since their storyline is so simple, they don't have to worry about tying up loose ends or anything. They can focus on you know, the music, the gameplay, etc., etc. So the same happens with your skits. Uh, you don't want a lot of like you know plot holes and plot developments to worry about, so if it's simple, then you can really just like hit it out of the park, essentially. And then uh, ensuring that your characters fit accurately into your storyline. So sometimes we see the skit that has like Naruto and Booker and like you know a bunch of different characters from all these different series, and we have no idea how they all got there. Uh, which happens when you have a bunch of friends and we're all gonna do a skit, but we're all cosplayed from different things. Uh, you can totally do that, but it's important to uh, figure out in your storyline how all these characters met. Maybe YouTube crashed, and now we're all all the people from all those videos are all together, whatever works, uh, but making sure that they aren't just kind of like spontaneously together. Implying backstory, so this is where the reference thing can kind of work. If you have a character who's, for example, like the grumpy one, you have like the really energetic one, you can imply that through the, the, uh, the storyline, how the characters are presented, uh, so that people don't have to know anything about these characters. You can just get the point. And then you can reference things like, remember when so-and-so was really annoying to me that one time? We get it, because one of them is grumpy, one of them is happy, etc., etc. And then, how you pre-written script, 
Um, I, I know a lot of people who say, oh, well, I can just improvise on the spot. It's not really the safest thing to do. Having a script is always helpful, having like a hard copy of what you're going to do rather than just kind of winging it on the day. Because we always think that we can kind of pull it together the day of, but then things get really hectic. And it's just good to have it all like carved in stone. You can kind of maybe, you know, improvise like a little tiny thing, but making sure that you have a basic idea of what you're going to do. So the hook, um, I'd rather reverse that point. Uh, identify skills that you have. So if you know, know acrobatics, you know dancing, you know singing, work that into your skit. Uh, if you don't know how to do acrobatics and you're going to try it for the first time on stage, maybe not the safest bet, but uh, the audience loves it when you have uh, skills like, you know, I know martial arts or I know dance, and you use that as your hook. Because it's really neat. Everybody's so talented and you can, like, you know, apply that to your cosplay skit. And then, um, yeah, that's essentially that. So, the other thing is, this is basically keeping your audience in mind because you're not just performing for yourself, but also for your audience. So if there's no official time limit in for the skits, most people have time limit, um, make sure that it's at very, the very most five minutes because everything after five minutes kind of kind of drags on for your audience. And you really want to leave them wanting more. If you like cut it off at three minutes and people are like, oh man, like I wish I could have seen more of it, that's better than if you know, it was like, oh, it went on for 10 minutes and I fell asleep, right? Uh, not that I would say that, but you get my point. Um, so yeah, five minutes is kind of like the absolute maximum that people will hold their attention to something like this. And then keep your audience in mind, like if you're having a lot of fun throwing in inside jokes, you know, from you and your friends on stage, like that's going to be fun for you guys, but the audience won't necessarily get it. So just keep your audience in mind, say, like we're having a great time, but if I was in the audience, would I be able to appreciate this skit at the same level? Audio. So, convention spaces are really bad about eating up noise. If you remember the Sakura Con, their hall is like, you just cannot project in that in that space. It's just huge. You can kind of get away with it in the lecture hall here, but uh, even so, the best bet is to pre-record your audio, unless you're going to like scream something into the audience. There are always exceptions, but really pre-recording your audio is your best bet to be heard. And of course, when you can't hear a skit, it really takes away, because nobody will know what's going on. Uh, so your microphone, when you're using microphone, make sure that you have recording uh, clear audio. I know the cheaper microphones, they get muffled, so unfortunately the audio quality goes down when it goes to the halls. Um, your computer will be right next to it. Very common for it to pick up buzz. Unfortunately, that also messes with the quality. And another thing is when you have a bunch of friends and they all have different microphones and you're all going to do your, your recorded pieces separately, uh, you have all of this stuff from different microphones. And so you kind of have a difference in quality when you kind of splice them together. So it's important to either make sure that you're all using like the same uh, model of microphone, or you all just go to somebody's house and use the same microphone so that you don't have that kind of difference. Uh, so in editing, of course you want to have enunciation. We all learn that in theater so that people can tell what you're saying, not mumbling. Um, here's something that some people maybe would consider. Uh, making sure that your audio level is the same, but not just like the click. Uh, some people talk louder than others. I know my lovely friend Chelsea here likes to talk way louder and I have a softer voice, so when we do get recordings, we make sure that we tune it so that the, the volume levels kind of stay the same, even though we have different like, vocal levels. And here's something interesting, never edit through headphones, because your uh, audio is going to be played over big speakers, and so you want to see what it's like when it's being played through speakers, because it sounds different when it's through headphones. So it's important to, when you're playing it back after you're editing, that you're listening to it through the speakers. Casting. So basically, this just uh, boils down to making sure that these are people who are going to pull through. Because everybody see it, you know, will say, oh yeah, I'd love to do a skit. It sounds like such a great idea. And then when push comes to shove, you know, the rubber hits the road, everybody's like, well, I don't really want to practice. So maybe we'll just wing it on the day out. These are not the people who, you know, as much as you might love them, not the best people to have in your skit, unfortunately. So ensure that these are people who have a good history, you know, pulling through, who aren't going to drop out when it, you know the hard work actually comes in. And um, you want to make sure that, yeah, you don't want anybody who has intense stage fright, so making sure that everybody has been on stage before. And then communication is the most important thing when you're orchestrating this. Because I know that when your group gets past, you know, three people, and even with three people, it can be really difficult to orchestrate that. Everybody's really busy, and some people might get like, you know, there, there will be miscommunication. Sometimes. So it's important to like really write everything down, say, you know, we're going to practice here, here, and here, get everybody's schedule. It can really go sideways when, when you know, there's not enough communication. Uh, so yeah, when it comes to doing your skit, it is a commitment. 
And some people kind of think, you know, it's all going to be fun, and it is going to be fun, but it's also going to be work. It's going to be absolutely fun work, but it will be work. So people need to understand that it's going to be a commitment. So when you're when you're picking out your group members and saying, hey, we're going to do this skit, you, you know, you guys got to be with me through the whole time. And then once you commit, you know, from the people who are going to be in the skit, once you commit to being in a skit, you can't really drop out unless you know you bro break two legs and your dog runs away. You know, we all have our excuses. Um, but yeah, once you commit, you really have to uh, stick to it. And of course, give your give your group as much. Uh, as much word ahead of time if you're going to drop out, if something absolutely you know comes up that you had no control over, you know, two months is kind of the the minimum amount of time people have to kind of pull things out of the fire. But basically, you know, making sure that there's respect both ways because when somebody drops out of you, it's really difficult to kind of put it back together. So making sure that you're empathetic in that way. So basically, your techniques. If you've ever done theater, you're like, okay, I've heard this a million times, but I'm just gonna go over them. Um, never turn your back to the audience because this not really helpful. Um, when talking to another performer, you want to make sure that you're in a V formation. Otherwise, you just get this. You just get like arm. It's not really a great visual. So you don't have like your chest out so people see you, and you can still talk as if you are like directly facing them. But for the audience's um, benefit, you want to be in a nice V formation, playing it up. So when you go on stage. Um, when you're like your energy decreases as it gets to the audience, right? So you might think that like I'm at normal energy, you know, if I'm on stage, but when it gets to the audience, it's going to be less than normal energy. So you really want to play up and like you know over exaggerate, not to the point that you look kind of weird, but um, making sure that you you do play up so that when that decrease happens, people aren't like oh that person doesn't look very energetic. And I'm always the acting. I saw a skit once um, where literally the the actors um, unfortunately they. They had their audio, and when they weren't saying their lines, they were just standing there. They didn't really, they weren't sure what they should be doing, so they were just standing there. And then when their line happened, then they were in, in character, and then when their line was over, they just stood. You always want to be in character, and you always want to be reacting to what's happening on stage, because that looks awesome. And then practice is important. A lot of people like to skim over practicing sometimes, uh, because we have such busy schedules, but unfortunately, uh, it's really important to practice so that when you get on, you don't have a panic attack. Like, what am I going to do? Um, so yeah, practice everything. Organize a practice schedule. And practice performing in front of somebody who will be okay with giving you feedback. So if you practice in front of your mom, she might be like, oh, it was great because everything you do is great. Uh, you want to find somebody who's actually going to give you feedback, not, you know, tear your hopes and dreams down, but like say, oh, I think you could improve on this rather than, you know, being, you know, just smiling a little and then um, writing down stage directions is always a good thing, just so that everybody knows where they're supposed to be on the stage. You can always mark, like, so and so is going to be here, and then they're going to move there, just so that there's no like confusion when you go to, to perform it. Because we can, we can always uh, practice our lines, but then sometimes the stage directions you might get a little confused. And this really helps when you're all going to be practicing on your own time, because people can just consult this little, this little choreography guide and say, oh, I'm going to be doing this, rather than having to be in the big group to remember all those things. And that's everything. So are there any questions? Anyone? Yes. Not really a question, but kind of a recording thing. Mm -hmm. um, if you have like either like an iPhone or just like a shitty microphone, like the one that's in my pocket here, um, if you go into a closet or like under a blanket or in a closet under a blanket, it like drastically improves the quality because there's less like like bouncing of like the audio off the walls and stuff like um my recording studio is basically a small closet with like luggage stacked up so there's like as little surface area as possible and then of course um under a blanket because i just want to be like 300 times sure and it really does like improve it like iphones have like really amazing microphones like this one isn't bad but like it, it sounds really really good when you record in a space with like no bouncing back off of things right yeah very good Anybody else? No. Yes. What, should, what What would you do if someone forgets their lines or what they're doing? Cry. You just keep going. <laughs> um, you just you just recover. You never like stop and say, Oh no, it's over. Like just just continue on and help that person and and be there for them. Basically, like be there to catch them when they forget something. Well, like even if you're if you're like you're doing it live, you can always be like. 
hint, hint with like what you say, because then there's a bit of improv there. Exactly. Like, hey, you remember that thing? Yeah. Yeah. Always just being supportive to your fellow skipmates, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And any advice on how to react to technical difficulties? Technical difficulties, you just keep on going. You don't let it destroy you. You just say, I'm going to keep going. Even if I have to do a funny dance. Last year. Yeah, that yeah, was last funny. Year. You just do a funny dance, improvise it, but don't let it destroy you. Don't let it be, oh my god, it's all ruined. Just like, have fun with it. Always have fun with it. And yes. didn't last year when the music cut out, you tried to incorporate it into your skit? We did. Like you said, like, like the, the game, game is crashed. lagging. Yeah, yeah. you know? Just, just keep going is the biggest thing. Yeah, because like it, it's like with improv, you have, basically in those situations you have to go like yes and and basically roll with it. Exactly. Because you can't you can't freak out because the audience because the audience like if I hadn't been there for the rehearsal, I would have been like oh maybe that was actually a part of the skit. Because that's what it kind of seems like because you played it off well. So like if you play it off well, people will be like oh maybe that was actually a part of it. You never know, right? Because they haven't seen the rehearsal, they don't know. They don't know. Yeah. Great. Any other questions? Yes. How do you get over stage fright? How do you get over stage fright? That's a good one. Um, huh. See, like, there's always the age old just picture people in their underwear. Um, I think it really gets better with practice, honestly. I think, um, yeah, you know, I think it's really great to perform in front of convention audiences because they're always supportive. Like, even if, you know, your pants fall down and you cry, you know, like, they're just like, that was great. That, that <laughs> happens actually, though. Like, yeah. Legitimately has happened in the past. Yeah. So if I was going to practice anywhere, I would be at a convention because they're all just like, everybody's, you know, full support. But it is really practice and just growing your confidence and saying, you know what, like, I am awesome on stage and nothing can get me down. Um, yeah, it's basically just like, getting all confident and, and practice, but it, it is a hard thing to get over. Like, um, you can even start with like a walk on, like just a really quick, like get on the stage pose. Like that's what I, I started with. Cause I, I had a bit of stage fright, but it was mostly my partner. And like, we basically did our first like skit thing was basically like a bunch of different poses that kind of told a story. And it was kind of a skit in a walk on. And that actually really helped the both of us. Cause when we went into actually doing skits, it was like, oh, we kind of know what the audience is going to be like and not to completely freak out because they're just going to be like, yeah. yeah. They're not scary. They're mm -hmm. not going to bite you. So Exactly. See, what I actually, now that I think about it, um, one really valuable thing that I learned doing theater is the zone. And the zone is when the audience isn't there. Like The audience does not exist because you are the character and you are in the story. And you're, in, you're doing what the character does. Um, so you're in that world. So these people don't exist because you're in, you know, you're in Hyrule or you're in like wherever your skit is taking place. So if you can just like get yourself into that headspace and be like, I am the character and I'm in this world and nobody's watching me and I'm gonna have a great time. That's that's an important thing to. I don't know. I, I found it valuable when I learned that. So. Yeah, it really does help. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but. Uh, I actually found uh, to get over stage fright. One of the, the first things you want to do is get a bunch of your friends that are in the skit with you to play audience for yeah. a couple practice sessions and that usually helps pretty much. That's a good one, yeah, because you still leave up, right? You might start with like your plush animals when you're five and then you get your friend and you get to kino people. Yeah, so know. baby steps, baby steps. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes, no? Okay, well, sweet. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much.